Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Maurice Brown Show. Welcome today, a screenwriter and filmmaker who has produced faith-based films such as The Fifth Quarter, A Question of Faith, and Redeemed, and just released by, uh, recently just released this past weekend, in fact, My Brother's Keeper, starring T.C. Stallings. He is also president and CEO of Man's Mackey Studios. Ladies and gentlemen, with no further ado, please welcome screenwriter Ty Man. Hey, thanks for having me. <laughs> What's up, thanks. Ty? How are you? Man, I'm doing really good. I appreciate you guys having me on today. Thank you. Man, I appreciate you having uh, being on the show. I mean, this this pandemic is has really been difficult for a lot of people. And you were just telling me you're just putting out a, a production fire. I mean, things uh -huh. happen, man, I tell you. <laughs> yeah, you know, you go to bed feeling really good about the day, and you wake up in the morning, there's all kinds of ankle biters everywhere. So, uh, but that's the business. It's what we chose to do. We love it. Uh, so I apologize for being a little bit late this morning. But here I am, and thanks again so much for having me. Man, it's an honor to have you on the show. And, and and speaking of, you know, production and filming and directing during this time of the pandemic, what is it like dealing with the COVID-19 issue? What is the protocol? Well, you know, to be honest, all of 2020, we just shut down. We shut down any productions that we had on our board because there was a time period where we didn't have any protocol. The, the, yeah. the industry was still trying to figure it out. So we didn't want to put anybody at risk just to make a film. So we decided we'd shut down production in 2020, work on some back-end infrastructure stuff that we wanted to get done. We did that. But now we have protocols. We do have uh, industry standards that they've put out that tells us, okay, this is how you do it this way. If this is how you have to test, this is how you have to keep people separated. So we're getting ready to head into a production the 28th of April. We'll okay. be off doing a production, but we're set. We have guidelines now. We know, and and you know, people have been doing it, so we have some guidelines and we have some lessons learned to fall back on now. So you had a big weekend. Uh, came out uh, this past weekend with My Brother's Keeper, starring T. C. Stallings, and uh, that it was select uh, select theaters is where the film opened up this weekend, and it centers on PTSD which is something that many wartime soldiers uh, have and are suffering from. Uh, tell us how that affected you personally, Ty. Well, you know, this, is, this story is loosely based on my father. Yes. It's loosely based on my father when he returned from Vietnam. And, and you know, some of the stuff that we saw as a 10, 11, 12-year-old boy back then that we just didn't understand what was going on. Yeah. Uh, all we knew is here he is, he's different, and we don't like him anymore because he's yelling and shouting and screaming and doing all this stuff all the time. Yeah. Uh, not being able to truly understand that he was fighting these demons. So from that aspect, it took me a while to, to sit and write this story because it's a bit of a difficult story for me to tell. I always wanted to. But it just took some time for me to say, okay, I, I feel comfortable. I can write this now. Yeah. And it just it was just a blessing that T.C. Stallings agreed to play the lead character, to play that role, because he does such a great job uh, yeah. in portraying some of those things that, you know, as a 10-year-old, 11-year-old boy, I saw. It's like sitting there watching it all over again. So Yes, yes. And, you know, I've, I've always been – a fan of Vietnam films, you know, like Apocalypse Now and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. Full Metal Jacket and Platoon and all that stuff growing up. I watch all that stuff and they, you know, Hollywood glorifies these films, but it, yeah. the reality is there are a lot of men who were in wars like that, uh, that, you know, are suffering, like I said, that right now from uh, PTSD. And it wasn't, you know, diagnosed as such back in the day. They used to call it shell shock. In fact, my dad, was yeah. in World War One and suffered from uh, that at the time. Again, it was called shell shock, and uh, he was a high school history teacher. And he had, you know, moments from time to time. It wasn't uh, uh, major, but you know, again, it was PTSD. We didn't know, 
Right, and, it, um, that's what we called it back then. We used to go, oh, I think he's shell-shocked. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, we used to say that all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's what we used to say. You know, and but again, you know, a lot of soldiers are, are suffering from it today as we speak. Uh, America's really never uh, acknowledged or appreciated or respected these men that have fought for our freedom, which is a real shame. Um, and I, I, I'm glad that you decided to do a film that centered around it. Now, your dad yeah. uh, came through at a time when, again, it was called shell shock, but he came through when mm -hmm. the church was available. And, and quite frankly and honestly, that's, I mean, Jesus Christ, my friend, is the only surefire way to get right. any problem solved. And it really did, a, it, he really did a tremendous job with your dad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I can't express how true that is because my mother, she packed the kids up and she used to say, we, we can't take this anymore. Yeah. And we moved, you know, we, we moved down the street for a few days to my grandmother's house. And he came there and they had a conversation. Of course, we grew up in small town, West Virginia, coal mining town. So yeah. we, we, didn't, we didn't have a lot of money. We couldn't afford, my family couldn't afford professional counseling, so to speak. Yes. But my, my grandmother suggested that they go to church and uh, talk to the pastor. And, you know, up to that point, you know, we went to church on Easter's and Christmas. Just <laughs> the normal, <laughs> yeah. you know, we weren't, a, we, we, weren't a, we weren't a family that was walking deeply in faith, I would say. But, you know, we, we go to church from time to time. Yes. But but anyway, they decided to do that. They, they decided they would go to the church and talk to the pastor and walking through those doors led to my father becoming a deacon, a minister and a pastor himself. Man, praise and, the Lord. Bro. Yeah, and, and it all started with him wanting to overcome those demons. Uh those demons that we didn't understand, but he he clearly said, okay, something's wrong with me and I need yeah. help. Yeah. And he 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 stuck to it. Now he later got professional counseling, but walking through that church door, it was definitely a bridge to get him to where he 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 needed to be. It was mm -hmm. that bridge and that that walk in faith that he started with that kept him there. Yes. So um yeah, big big changes for us back then. Well, well, God bless you for addressing the subject. Hello, hello, Gigi. How are you? Good to see you, Gigi Orsillo. Hello, Ms. Gigi. Yep. Who was in the film Sleeper Agent with uh, Leland Klaassen, a very very good film, very good comedy. Um, yeah, I, you know, and I, again, you know, Hollywood has always tried to uh, glorify war, as it were, mm -hmm. uh, particularly again in the seventies and eighties with the Vietnam uh, films and so forth. And and I was. I was a kid. I mean, I was in my teens when those films came out. So I, I mean, I thought they were awesome and so forth. But it's, it's really uh, a serious thing, and what happens to men when they come back. So I, I, I love the the fact that you did the film. How did the film do over the weekend? Yeah, we haven't gotten our numbers back. Uh, we should get them back today or tomorrow. But you know, we understand we're in a COVID world, right? And we, we've gotten some uh, people sent us stuff saying, oh, look, it's sold out. Uh, and that's great. I mean, believe me, sold out is sold out. Yes, uh, yes. But we understand what sold out means in this environment. So if you go into a theater and its capacity is 300, then if they're operating at 40 percent, then that's sold out. <clears throat> right, right. So the numbers that, I'm, that I think we would have seen in a non-COVID environment they may not be there, but we all believe that the film is doing well from based on the re reviews. And uh, we believe that we'll get to those monetary points that we want to hit. Yeah. In in the COVID world, it just may take a little bit longer, but that's OK, because the idea of this movie is so that not so much is money. We're a business, so we need to make money. We have people that we have to feed and pay back. But the idea is that this movie is also out there to just show people that, Hey, if you, there's some, some suffering going on in your life, uh, here's a possible path that you can take. And, um, 
as long as it's out there, that's what it's doing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. If it absolutely. takes us a little longer to hit the monetary value, that means more eyes are seeing it and we just love it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, are there, uh, what are the plans going forward with uh, the virtual platform? Yeah. So I, I don't know the exact date yet, but we do know that sometime late April, late May, rather, mid to late May, it'll start hitting the DVD worlds and all of the streaming stuff. So that's all coming. But okay. I think right now, the, the last word we got on that was that they were going to announce a date. It's going to be mid to late May when all of the streaming and DVD and all that would hit. So just hang tight. It's all coming for sure. And well, Universal, I, I, Universal Studios will be releasing all of that. What was it like working with T.C. Stallings today? Well, you know, that's, that's my guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I met T.C. on the set of A Question of Faith. Mm -hmm. and, um, he, and if you ever talk to him, he'll tell you the story. But we first words we spoke were at the craft table, the crafty table. Uh, one day on the set, I was standing there. He walked up. And I just remember saying something like, man, you know, I've seen you in War Room. I'm watching you perform in this movie. You're really good. Uh, and I remember telling him, I said, but, you know, I, I think you could really pull off this role I have in my head in this, this movie I want to write. Yes. Yeah. I was like, so if I write it, would you want to perform it for me? And, you know, he was very nice. <coughs> Excuse me. He was very nice. He's like, oh, yeah, 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 just do it. You know, and at that point, he had no idea who I was. Yeah. Yeah. And so I said, well, good. I said, well, I'm glad you will because, you know, I wrote this movie. And then he's like, oh, wait a minute. I didn't know you wrote A Question of Faith. And I was like, yeah, I wrote the movie you're working on right now. <laughs> and so he's like, oh, yeah, then send me the script. So a couple weeks later, I did. I sent him the script to my brother's keeper. He read it and said, man, I, I got to do this. But TC is just such a professional. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you have to respect that because he prepares and he gets ready for his roles and when he gets out there, he's just giving you everything he has in his tank to Amen. perform. Yes. And, you know, you, you find yourself becoming a fan really quick. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and, so, and he's just a joy to be around. He and his family are just wonderful people. But the performance he gives in this movie is I just think it's incredible. I think it's just amazing performance he gave. I definitely want to see it. I didn't get a chance to get out over the weekend. As you accurately stated, this COVID-19 environment, dude, it just makes yeah. everything more difficult than it normally uh, would be. Right. But I, I'm definitely going to see the film. I've seen TC in uh, War Room, Courageous, God's Compass. Uh, yeah. The guy is a really, really talented actor, and um, he could, you know, TC. You take guys like uh, Ty. You take guys like TC Stallings and and, and Cameron Arnett, uh, for example. I could use a lot more, but I'll use those two guys for example. If they wanted to be doing something in the secular world, oh, and yeah. you know, doubling, doubling, and tripling their their income, they could easily do it. They they could yeah. easily do it, but they have chosen to follow Christ and work for Christ and mm -hmm. honor the gifts the Lord has given them, you know, for him. I mean, you just have to love and appreciate it. And then mm -hmm. on our end as uh, entertainers and co-actors, directors and so forth, we're blessed, you know, to have, and I could give a lot more names out yeah. just using those two uh, as an example of how blessed we are to have people like that mm -hmm. in the faith-based industry. No, yeah, you're right. You, I, I think you got a listener right now, Gigi, who's another one of those talents that. Oh, Gigi Marcelo uh, is another great example. Is, right. Absolutely. Who's you know just another one of those talents that yeah they have what it takes to go wherever they want to go. Yeah, that's for sure. A absolutely. Uh, the fact that they're choosing to to like you say do work in this this genre and stay close to their faith. That's a personal choice, not a, yeah. because they can go wherever they want to go. The, oh, they, yeah. the, the talent is there. And I will tell you that I've, I've worked with TC. This is the third movie, third movie I've worked with TC on. Okay. But when you see his performance on this one, it's going to be like, whoa. 
you know, you, you're going to see a different gear in TC on this. Wow. Movie. So, <laughs> okay. You're gonna see a, you, you're gonna see a different gear. That's all, I think that's the best way I can describe it because he, you know, you know, PTSD is a tough subject, right? You can't, yeah, yeah. You you don't want to be over the top with it, but you don't want to downplay it either. The the reality of it. So he found a way to to make it work and make yes. it believable. And um, I told him the other day when I was talking to him, and I said, yeah, you, you kicked in another gear on this one, brother. <laughs> I'll tell you right now. Yes, um, he did. He, he, I, well, I, I haven't seen, I, I can, I cannot wait to see yeah, the film, you yeah. know, for a guy like TC to kick it even into another gear, dude. I can't wait to see this. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait for you to see it. And I guarantee you, after you see it, you'll, you'll text me and call me and tell me what you think. <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll, I, 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 I do believe you will say you're right, Ty. That was a different gear. <laughs> well, you know, when you're when you're talking about a subject like this, like you said, PTSD. I mean, it requires you to dig down deeper as an actor or an actress than you normally would. I uh, and I and I had a chance to witness in 2016 as I was in the film uh, Love Different with Tommy mm -hmm. Ford from the TV mm -hmm. show Martin from back in the day directed by Anthony Hackett and also starred Jen Gotts and Chandler. We had a scene where crying was required. And I mm -hmm. watched, I don't know if you've ever met Anthony Hackett or Jen Gotson, but I watched these two pray themselves up to tears. But even before we mm -hmm. shot the scene, they, they were mm -hmm. praying and, and I'm like in the scene, I'm the bad guy. So of course I didn't have to cry. <laughs> right, right. But I'm, I'm <laughs> I'm, I'm watching this and I was, dude, I, I was totally amazed. I mean, they yeah. were like, I mean, and they were wet. Their faces were wet with tears. We went and did the scene and we had to do it multiple times and they were, they were able to get there. But I, it, I just said that to say that it requires something deeper for actors yeah. to, to reach certain emotional levels. And I, I totally respect mm -hmm. the heck mm -hmm. out of that. And I can't wait to see TC in this man. I well, you know, you're you're 100 percent right, but I, I, you know, I, I will tell you this, and you know, that cast is they were so good. Uh, you talk about those moments, you know, with Keisha, the way she was playing off TC's character. Yeah, uh, Blue Kimball is he plays the uh, the bad guy in the movie, and let me tell you something. <laughs> That guy pulls it off. I don't. Okay. Uh, Blue Kimball is an excellent young actor that that I just love putting him to work any chance I can get because you know he's like an enigma. You just never really know what you're going to get from a performance <laughs> from him. Yeah, but yeah. you know it's going to be good. A absolutely, uh, absolutely. And uh, <laughs> Jeff Rose played the pastor in the movie, and I got to tell you, he's. He was exactly what was needed for that character, this common voice in the storm. Mm -hmm. um, but then you have Robert Richard, who you're talking about this crime scene. There was a scene in there that you're going to see between he and TC okay. where we could have just left it on the first take, to be honest with you, because yeah. he just blew everybody away. He and TC did that scene so well that I remember sitting behind, and I was in Village Studio sitting there watching the monitors. We have all the keys and all the people behind us. And after they said cut, I looked behind me and everybody was crying. All oh the gosh. crew people were just back there crying. Oh, man. Oh, and wow. I did. I walked over to him and I just said, you know, guys, uh, I didn't write that scene that good. Okay. You guys did an amazing job. And then, of course, we had Greg Allen Williams and... <laughs> Yeah, Greg Allen Williams is a lesson every time he walks on set. That's how I think oh, of him. Oh man, that's amazing. <laughs> he's uh he's it's like, all right, sit down, take out your notes and watch how it's really done type guy. Yes, sir. And, yes, sir. Um, and his heart is so humble and he's just so open to wanting to help, especially writers like myself of color. He's like, I will be there to help you if it's just to say a word or two. But you always know when Greg walk on set. You just sit back and just watch it. You don't have to do any directing. You don't have to do any of that. You just sit back and enjoy the Greg Allen Williams show because you're because <laughs> okay. you're gonna get a show in every scene. That's just how good that man is. And yeah. TC and 
all those guys, they recognize that. And he will sit there and talk to those guys, talk to young people on the set all day, just sharing his knowledge. And so we had a fantastic crew. I just, you know, I love them all. They, I, I just hope that when you guys, you know, when you see the movie and your fans see the movie, they'll just appreciate that hard work that those guys put in to make this movie. They did a wonderful job. Amen. Amen. Sounds great. Sounds great, Ty. I uh, I had a chance to host a couple of shows focusing on the lack of diversity in faith-based films. And, and it's great to see a person of color like yourself putting great films together in the faith-based world in particular. Uh, do you see an improvement taking place for people of color in faith-based films? Ooh, you're going to force me to... <laughs> <clears throat> wow. Okay. This is one of those politically correct answers I need to think about for a second. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, wow. Um, Just speak your heart, Ty. I, yeah, I'm trying to without making, I got, you know, of course, I got to make sure I'm not making people mad. <clears throat> yes. That, yes. Uh, but, um, you know, the short answer to that would be, it's still not as easy. Right. You know, it's still not as easy. Um, and it's not as easy, not only for people of color who accept the movie. It's, you know, we, we find walls that are difficult to get around from people who are of color. Yes. Yes. When I go sit and talk to someone and, and I'll, I'll share this with you because these are true examples, but I've yep. gone and sat with people and said, Hey, my name is Ty Manns. Um, we have this movie that's coming out. We've set up arrangements so that your church can see the movie. And Oh, by the way, we're going to give you 15% back on any ticket sales that you sell. Cause we want to sew back into your ministry. Yes. I actually said those almost exact words to a pastor and I was told, so are you with Tyler Perry? <laughs> so, well, no, you know, I'm Ty Mans with Mans Mackey Studios and we have this wonderful movie and you, you know, we're making it so that you can get some money back. We want to show into your ministry if you show this film. Yeah. So do you, and, and, and I mean, almost on cue, the next question was, so do you have anything to do with the Kendrick brothers? Okay. So it's a comparison. It's a thing of, well, if you have something to do with A or something to do with B, then we'll work with you. And this was a person of color. That's amazing. So it wasn't a, you know, what you kind of would have loved to have heard, or at least I can only tell you what I would have said. I would have said, hey, you know what? Yeah, let me see what you have. Let me take a look at it. And if it's something that, my, I would be interested in, or I feel like I could show it at my church, I'd be happy to do that, especially since you're going to sow back into my ministry. Right. 100%. That's kind of like how I would have approached it and said it. But I got nowhere with this person because I wasn't working with Tyler Perry and I had no association with the Kendrick brothers. And so I finally just asked the question. I said, so if this was a Kendrick's brother movie, you would be happy to show it? Oh, yeah, yeah. We show those movies all the time. <laughs> okay. And, and that's nothing against the Kendrick brothers because I love those guys. They've been, whenever I've talked oh, yeah, to sure. them, they've been very helpful to me and gave me great advice. But it just goes to show you the challenges that, at least myself as a black filmmaker, as a black Christian filmmaker, still face. Yes. I, uh, I was talking with the actor Skeeta Jenkins about uh, I'm, last summer. I, he's, uh, he was on the show and he's been in some really good films, uh, African-American actor. And we got into a great conversation after the show on this subject, which inspired me to do a series on the lack of diversity in faith-based <clears throat> films, not to mm. prick anyone or to have contention, mm. just merely acknowledging a fact 
that yeah. there is an issue in that regard. And I think it should be put on the table. It should be addressed just for the sake of conversation to have a starting point. Yeah. Uh, and, and that I, way, I, I would participate in that. Well, I, I I've, got, will. I've got a uh, series part five coming up mm -hmm. in a couple of months, uh, with, uh, African-American model Yvette Morales. And I'd like to get TC Stallings, you know, TC is very mm -hmm. difficult to catch up with. Him. He's as yeah. fast as he is on the football yeah, field when he he's running that rock, dude. I can't <laughs> catch him. Yeah, he is. He's, he's he's working. Yeah, he just got picked up on that new TV show, Vindication, which is great. It's a recurring oh, wow. role. So oh, we're man. excited for him. I can't wait him, to see that. Yeah, yeah. So anyways, I've, I've, I've been making some attempts to uh, contact him. I've had Cameron on uh, for one of the shows. But long story short, uh, I will definitely contact you for that because this is an issue, again, not to start contention, but just to simply right. address the fact that there's a gaping hole there. And the person you were talking with, Ty, it, it was was a person of color, and they were yeah. get, giving you the stiff arm. Uh, and it's nothing against the Kendrick brothers or anything like no, that, no. or Tyler Perry. It's <clears throat> just it seemed like to me they would have asked to, okay, let me let me see your film. Let me you know look at your background right. or something instead of just jumping right to, like you said, point A and B. Yeah. No, exactly. And that's that's what... You know, that's what we've tried to do. We've 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 also had a major theater chain uh, that didn't show our movie this time. Wow. Um, elected not to show the movie at all for whatever reason. And <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> I can say that because it's been all over my social media. I mean, I had to put out an apology because we shot this movie in Columbus, Georgia. OK. Columbus, Georgia is a military town. We have Fort Benning, the second largest army installation in, in, the, in the military here. Okay. It's a military movie. Yes. And yet the local AMC decided not to show the movie. And Do you have any idea what the, the reasons were? Well, we didn't because we just, we, we never, I mean, we just never really got an answer. <clears throat> so, uh, the National Infantry Museum that sits right outside of Fort Bend and said, hey, we'll show your movie. So okay. they're, they're doing two showings this Sunday, for example, and they sold out both those shows in less than 20 minutes. Wow. And But the local AMC, so we go back and forth, and I had to put an apology out on social media because people from Columbus, was kind of, they were kind of beating us up. Hey, man, Smacky, why aren't you showing the movie here? We, we help you in the city. Well, it's not our decision, of course. It's up to the theaters to what movies they book. Yeah. Um, so we had to even fight that fight. Here we are. We are a, a small veteran-owned, minority-owned production company. We shoot a movie in a military town. Uh, it's about a military story. And... It stars predominantly uh, African American talent, and yet we couldn't get it put into a local theater here. Well, you know what? I, I, I'm going to say this, and this is something that's going to be left for the next uh, lack of diversity in faith based films show that I do in a, a month or two here. But the reality, as uh, African Americans, you and I understand, we're we're from an era that was. Uh, much more hardcore than this generation, which is hardcore enough. But this generation, these these kids, they don't know the things that we witnessed and Absolutely. experienced. But the reality is uh, a guy like you and I, we, we look at My Brother's Keeper and you have an African-American lead in T.C. Stallings, who, who who is a presence just looking at him. He's yeah. a presence. Yeah. What an, I mean, <laughs> T.C. doesn't even have to speak, man, and he has an awesome <clears throat> aura about himself. But unfortunately, Ty, in a place like Georgia, in certain theaters, it's unwelcomed. And the first checkoff is, well, this is a black movie and we don't want to see it. Um, and I hate saying things like that, but I have to keep it 100. And it's unfortunate because it does go on and it continues to go on in America. In fact, to the extent, I'm going to leave it alone after I say this, it's worse here than in any other place in the world. The freest <clears throat> place in the entire yeah. world Right. Still has a problem with this particular subject, but um, I I think that is a travesty 
And uh, Jonathan Nicholas says the enemy's hand is at work against your team, which is only a setup for the Lord to pour out his favor upon you. Great yep, words, yep. John. <clears throat> Thank you, Great brother words. John. He's, that's a good dude right there. That's yes. a good dude. He's a good dude. <clears throat> yeah, okay. I, you know, I, I don't know, man. You know, we, we're just as, we're, we're just trying to figure it out ourselves. Uh, sometimes, like, and Jonathan's thank you. I needed those words, Jonathan, because there were times and there have been times when I've just said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm writing movies that people will respond to and come back and say after they see it, like, oh, that was really good. The people that see it really appreciate it. Yes. But it feels like what what people want me to write or stories where we're uh, people of color were stupid, were silly. We're uneducated. We're killing each other. We're cheating on our wives and husbands. I just feel like that's what they want. Like, oh, well, you know, you're not making a fool out of yourself, so we're not interested in the movie. But, right. you know, I'm just not led to do that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm being led to write these stories that God puts in my head and say, okay, this is the one I want you to write next. You know, this, yeah, this yeah. isn't a talent that I grew by getting older or adding water. <laughs> This is a talent of, you know, God has blessed me with something here and I'm just trying to be obedient. Absolutely. 100%. But it just feels like every movie, there's this pushback. And sadly, some of that pushback comes from people of color. Uh, sadly. And, and add it to the fact that, you know, you're, you're, you're actually showing an admirable story of a person yeah. of color. Yeah, and, you know, yeah. this is not the typical narrative that most people are used right. to and right. run to go see. Yeah, that fits in the cubby hole that I have for that particular, you right. know, ethnicity. That, that's where they. So not only yeah. that, you're talking about a faith based film as well. And, and that adds to more pushback, like because people don't want to talk about right. God. They don't want to talk about, you know, Christ and how, you know, amazing <laughs> He yeah, is, yeah. you know, that people don't want to hear that either. So then right. you got like a double knock against uh, the, the project. But like Jonathan Nicholas said, you know, you, the Lord is going to to bring you uh, through this like gold. I must decrease so that he may increase. Mm -hmm. Watch what Abba Father is about to do with Mads Mackey Studios. Amen. Praise yeah. God for that, John. I, I totally uh, acknowledge and agree with that statement. And 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 as we say this, Ty, since we're on the faith-based film subject, do you think that secular viewers in 2021 are starting to become more attracted to faith-based films? I think there's a path there for them. Um, you know, some of our viewers, for sure, are also secular viewers of film. I'm a secular viewer. I'm, I like to see the next big Marvel movie myself. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, I'm still yeah. I'm, I'm still a yeah. kid at heart at most oh, same points. Here. Huh? Same here. So, yes, sir. Um I just you know I choose what genres of the secular world that I will go see because I'm just some some genres I'm just not interested in. It's like well, I'm just not a big fan of that genre. But yeah. I like I like you know, a good drama or a good action movie just as well as anyone else. And I know that a lot of the people that go see the movies that we do. Or the same way, but yes. I may go see, uh, you know, the next uh, Star Wars movie or the next Marvel movie, but I still go to church Sunday and praise my God. So it, it's just a movie; it's entertainment. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's it. Yeah, and and I, and I think some of the people who who do the same thing there are people that from my church to say, "Hey, yeah, did you see the did you see the new John Snyder Batman movie, for example, or Justice League movie?" We'll talk about that. But yeah. then they'll go, oh, but man, I saw your movie the other day. It was great. So there are people out there that, that go to both and entertain both. But we do understand that we make these movies specifically for a market. Yeah. And we have to be, I, mean, I love reading the reviews from my movies. I love them, good and bad. Because <laughs> yeah. I, I can always point out the reviews that have someone who has a good creative eye. Because sometimes I'll watch one of my own movies and go, God, I could have done that better. I could have really done that better. I could have written that better. And, and you see where some of the critics will pick that up. Yeah. 
But then I can also tell the critics that don't like God, that don't like religion. Oh, yes. Because they will just pound on the story and it is it's completely personal. You can feel how personal it is it. Yes. that you know you want to believe in this person you can't see. And they'll, it's nothing to do about the story. No. no. <laughs> but I love reading it because I'm going, okay, that's a challenge for me. I need to figure out how to write something that will get this person to take a step toward God. Well, you actually had already done that. The fact that you pricked something that had nothing to do with the quality of the film. Right, right. There you go. That's well you know, said. You, you already hit them. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and, yeah. and it's just going to take a couple of more hits, uh, but eventually they'll be drawn in if we keep doing what we're doing in the faith-based world. Jonathan yeah. Nicholas says, secular world is hungry for convincing faith-based projects, which leads me to my next question. Do you think uh, that there's something uh, that the faith-based world could do when it comes to creating content in a feature length film or a series for that matter, uh, that can be approved upon in drawing the secular viewer? Well, um, again, it's that fine line you, 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 you walk, isn't it? Because the faith based community, you, you want to deliver them to them what they come to expect. Now, you don't want to have that in overabundance. You don't want them to sit through a 97-minute movie and it feels like they sat through a, a church sermon. That's right. not entertainment. Right. So is that fine line between entertainment and the faith? Yes. So for me, when I'm writing, I try to let the story itself carry the movie, but interject the faith inside of that where it fits in that moment in the story. <clears throat> yes. you know, I, I had someone ask me one time, so when do you know when to write a Bible verse? Like what pages do you want to write your Bible verses in? And, I, and, I, and my reply was, I may never write a Bible verse at all if it don't call for it. <clears throat> the story has to call for it. <laughs> yes. But you better believe faith will be portrayed in that story with or without Bible verses. So right. when I do add Bible verses into my stories, it has to be natural where it's just a conversation and it comes across as a conversation. So the, if you get start, if you start getting too far away from that, then I'm not sure you have faith based movies anymore. And I'll give you a good example of that. Um, I went and saw, I think it was Hacksaw Ridge, uh, where the, the army medic are <clears throat> lowering the people down. Yes. Well, at the end of the movie, he's looking for his Bible. They hand him his Bible and you see him being pulled down the ropes off the cliff and you see the stars, and, I mean, the clouds and all that. Well, someone said, well, that was a great faith-based movie. I said, I saw about 50 people get killed in that movie with their heads blown off in the first two minutes of the action scene. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. This is a war movie with some faith in it, but yeah. it, that wasn't a faith-based movie. But you got to be careful with that, I think, as faith-based yeah. film writers. We got to make sure we understand who we're really trying to deliver our product to. Okay. Uh, and I'm clear. I love it when... People come see my movie, anyone, but, you know, the movies we're making, we're making for God and we're making to deliver to that, that part of the community to say, I just want to go see a good movie about God. Yes. And, and that's what we're, that's who we're delivering it to. So what do you that's say, uh, Ty, to those secular viewers who are, are not drawn to that kind of film where they're like, you know, this is not reality. This is, this is really not the real world. It's not the world I live in. And, and then mm -hmm. they just turn it off. They don't even come to the theater. But what do you say to people that, that have detracting uh, statements or commentary uh, in that vein? Well, let me start with the detracting, distracting commentaries. Uh, thank you. Cause I spent 24 years in my uniform. My wife spent, 10 years in her military uniform. My oldest boy is the second lieutenant Marine Corps. My youngest boy is getting ready to get commissioned second lieutenant army. We, myself and many others have stood in those uniforms so that you can have the right to say what you want to say. 
So thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. You know, it shows that what we did over all those years and what so many people have done over all those years in uniform is working. You do have the freedom to write and print what you want about your opinion on something. Uh, in regards to the people who go, well, that's a Christian movie or church movie. I don't want to see it. Not all movies are, you know, well, I'll try to write movies that take on real life issues, uh, PTSD, the loss of a friend, and yep. then follow that story and have show how faith can help you. So although they're faith-based stories, you know, I try to write stories that anyone can sit down and see themselves up on the screen. Right, right. Maybe not in the lead character, but maybe, for example, in Keisha's care, somebody who's been who's been trying to help someone with a mental illness. Uh, maybe not in Keisha's character, but maybe in Robert's character, someone who has you know been holding back a secret, afraid to tell someone because it may ruin a, a dear relationship and a dear friendship. You know, I think people like that exist everywhere, all day, every day. Yes, and if. If, if you're that person, you'll see yourself on the screen and you'll be able to go, OK, I, maybe this is what I need to do. This was actually entertaining, but it wasn't just about someone standing around preaching the whole time on the scene. Exactly. Great. Which is a great response. Great response. Ty, how did you get started into filmmaking? Well, I've always wanted to write. Uh, even from my high school, junior high school days, I was always interested in the creative world and mainly the writing. <clears throat> you know, I would read so many books about all different subjects and how to write. So I was doing that even when I was in the military. I was okay. I was teaching myself how to write when I was in the military. I was reading all kinds. Of, we didn't have the Internet when I first went in the military. But I read, I would, you know, other guys would be out doing things. I'd be in the library reading a book about how to write a movie. Uh, oh, man. Wow. And so I've always had that passion to write. Uh, but it's, you know, you're in the military, so that takes up like 120% of your time. <laughs> so, <laughs> I can only imagine. Yes, uh, sir. But you know, I just got to a point where, when uh, I, I retired from the military, I went into corporate America for ten years. I always knew I wanted to start, you know, a company. I didn't know what I didn't know the name. I didn't know it would be Mass Mackey Studios then. But when I retired from the military after twenty four years, I felt like okay, I have a good grip on the leadership pieces. But what I needed more was managerial experience. Okay. So I went into corporate America for ten years after I retired from the military, two thousand three to two thousand thirteen. I worked corporate America. I was a product manager and worked my way into a a vice president's position and then uh, into a vice president of all North America and into a basically a CEO position of a small company my last three years. And then when I resigned out of that, I felt like, OK, I know enough now to start a company. I know how to run it. I know how to lead it. And that's when I, you know, I, you know, I stood up Ty Man's Productions, and then a couple of years later, after I met Bishop Mackey, we stood up Man's Mackey Studios. So it's been something that I've been wanting to do for years. Yeah. But the time I spent in that uniform was it my time. It was at that time were those soldiers' time that I was leading and were responsible for. So I couldn't take my personal time away from them because yeah. if I did that, it's a possibility. I could have caused one of them to die, either in yes. training or combat. So I just made sure that while I was in uniform that, yeah, I may have read some books here and there. I watched videos on my spare time. But when I when I strapped that uniform on, I all of my time belonged to them. Yes. I just made sure of that. Now, directing, filmmaking, screenwriting, producing, the whole nine yards. And I've had the opportunity to talk with some fine uh, directors like Paul Young and mm -hmm. Christopher Sean Shaw, Jared O'Flaherty. And, and I, I've gotten an idea that, you know, you guys live in a completely different world of responsibility. And you go through yeah. all kinds of unbelievable stuff that the actor, you know, has no idea about. You know, we show up, we do our scenes and so forth, and that's hard enough. But, you know, 
that's where it stops. It, 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 it not only does that include you, but it far exceeds that <laughs> for you guys. You know, you guys are doing all kinds of things. I mean, just before we started, you, you know, you were putting out a production fire. So yeah. you've been through a lot of things. You've, you've done some fine films. What, what is the biggest thing after all the time you've been involved in this industry, Ty, that you have learned about it that's made you better at it? Uh, listening. I will tell you that. I mean, that um, that's probably one of the biggest things that that just me sit, me put myself in a position to sit and listen to someone share something with me and, and be able to apply that later. Um, before I made this transformation in my mind a few years ago, I always considered myself as a screenwriter. I said, I'm a screenplay writer. I would go meet people and go, oh, yeah, I'm a screenplay writer. I write scripts, movie scripts. I write screenplays. And uh, I read a book. This would have been in 2015-ish or so. I read this book, and then I was talking to a guy in the industry about what I read, and he started elaborating on me on it. And it changed my whole philosophy because at that very moment, I realized that, yes, I could write a screenplay. I was a screenplay writer. Yes. But I, I wasn't telling stories. Mm. And, and just that conversation with him kind of opened up my mind to that. And the light bulb just went off. And I was like, you know what? You're right. I've been all these years writing these screenplays, but I really haven't been telling a story. So I went back and I pulled out uh, the script, A Question of Faith, that yes. I, I wrote that movie in 2006. And now okay. here we are in 2016, I wrote that movie, uh, I pulled it out rather, and I, I went back and I made it a story. Okay. And I end up, I said, well, I wanna get some notes on it. So I sent it off to this uh, competition and yeah, I, I, and I, I would do that quite frequently so I can get the notes. But I end up winning. They, a few months later, they call and say, hey, you won. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and the next day, the producer called and said, okay, we're collecting scripts. We have our budget. Uh, we saw uh, that you just won this contest. Would you want to send us your script? I said, sure, I'll send it to you. And I did. And they, and they told me, they said, hey, look, we... We're collecting scripts. We're going to have, we already have three or four. We're going to make a decision in about two weeks, which one we'll go with. I'm like, yeah, here you go. So I sent them mine. Well, two days later, they called and said, okay, forget everything we said. We're making your movie. It's done. We've made the decision. <laughs> okay, man. Wow. But, but it was that blessing because I had finally learned how to tell a story. And so now I try not to even refer to myself when I teach seminars I try to tell people, stop thinking of yourself as screenplay writers, because I wrote my first screenplay in 1991. So from 1991 to 2016, I had a hobby. But since 2016, I've had a career. And wow. that's the difference. Yes. I went from being a screenplay writer with a hobby to a storyteller with a career. Yes. And and that's that's what I learned was hey, when somebody is trying to share with you something, listen to them and then go back and see if that will apply to you and make you better. Because had I not listened to my buddy that day telling me, Yeah, I've been trying to tell you this, you've been missing the point on a lot of your stuff, but you gotta listen to what I'm telling you. And when yeah. I finally I was like, Okay, you got it. Yes. So um, that's my biggest piece. My ear is always open and I try to give back as much of that as possible. I try to help people where I can. My bandwidth has gotten smaller for sure. Yes. Uh, legally, I have limitations now. Yes. Because, uh, you know, my agents and my lawyers will go up. Oh, you can't say that or you can't do that. You can't read that. Don't do this. And yes. I, I just want to grab your script and read it like, oh, yeah, let me read it. I love to. But now yeah. I got lawyers whispering in the air going, no, you got, you can't do that anymore. You, you, you got to stop doing that. Wow. <laughs> so, so, you know, my bandwidth is, is smaller, 
but I still try to share information and help people any way I can because, you know, God put me in this position through support. And Amen, I just brother. want to make Praise sure I pass it back. 100%. I love, I love asking that question, Ty, because I think there's a point in, in any skill or craft that you, you are at clearly in the process of mastering or have mastered, uh, particularly in entertainment, whether you be an actor, a director, or a comedian, and, and, you know, which I am a stand-up comic and actor. Mm -hmm. And there, there's a point of, of, of uh, I, I, it's actually very close, in my opinion, to a crossroads experience. <clears throat> but there's a point where you go, I, my game just went up like four levels because I took some experiences or conversations or what have you, and I soaked them in, and and it made all the difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it mm -hmm. made all the difference. I mean, the light literally came on at that moment, and and I love asking that question because it 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 for, it's 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 something that happens to everybody. It's a very intriguing yeah. moment in the maturation process. Yeah. For, for an individual. And uh, so I just love asking that question. There's always that turning point where, oh, wow, I, I really need it to make this adjustment. And you, right. you go to the next level. Um, and I, the next question I want to ask you, and it's all, you kind of sort of answered it, but it's still a different type of question. What kind of advice, Ty, can you leave with young screenwriters, uh, young young filmmakers and producers and directors that are thinking about making this their life? Yeah, look, um, yeah, if, if, if I can do it, anybody can. <laughs> Let's start there. I mean, I'm, I'm not the most technically sound guy in the world. I'm like, God gave me the gift. To, to, to write stories on paper, but boy, it's hard for me to figure out how to plug my headset into my computer here and some stuff like that. <clears throat> but, you know, that's part of it, isn't it? And this is what I would say, and I like to tell people from a writing aspect, again, is stop worrying about writing the screenplay and learn how to tell your story. If you can learn how to tell the story, then somebody will be interested in maybe putting that on, you know, in some form of distribution where people can see that's the critical thing for writers is just focus on telling a good story, read books or go watch videos or whatever and figure out how you write a good story. Yeah. From a, from the producer standpoint, don't think you can do it overnight because you just cannot. And don't think you can do it by yourself because you cannot. Uh, mm -hmm. We've had, I mean, we've literally had people that we wanted to hire uh, to do work on movies for us. And we, you know, we had this one person say, well, I, I want to be a producer. I don't want to do that job. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying, well, okay. And I went to IMDB and found out that this person had just one credit under the note. <laughs> so, well, how do you think you're ready to be a producer? Yes. Producer's work is completely different than any other work. So don't think you can do it overnight. You know what I mean? Don't think that it's something that you can say, well, I did a couple of short films. Now I want to be a producer. You have to work at this and you have to work yeah. your way into this. Um, and, and you have to surround yourself with knowledge and information. You know, we have a producer, Robert Bigelow, who's our senior producer on the Mans Mackey. Robert has 20 some years worth of experience. He's worked on, he's an Emmy award winning sound supervisor he's worked on Treme he get out ma the hunt i mean this guy has years of experience years of dealing with the universals and paramounts of the world on yeah. how to deliver a film how to get a film put together and deliver man uh, you know i'm like a leech on that guy right now <laughs> yes uh, he he can't talk to me enough i know he probably gets tired of talking to me but i'm just trying to just Wow, I mean, you have twenty some years of experience on that's you know big movies, twenty, thirty, forty million dollar movies. Yeah, and then we have another gentleman, uh, Thomas Dawson, who for the last thirty plus years he's been the keyboardist. I think the last thirty five years he's been the keyboardist and the band director of the Commodores. So who else can you know any music wow. producing? You know what I mean? He has it. So don't feel like 
you need to do it alone if you're out there and you want to be a producer. Find your find your path to get you there. And when you get there, surround yourself with people who are much smarter than you and then let them do what they do. Yes. Let them do yeah. what they do. And you just keep the ship. You know, the way I see it as the principal of Man's Mackey Studios is I'm just a guy back there holding on to the, the steer and the oar to the boat. So I, you know, trying to just keep it on course while they do all the heavy lifting now. You know, yes. Bishop Mackey and Thomas and, and Robert, they're doing all the heavy list, lifting. All I'm doing is just kind of steering the ship. You know, if we get a little off course, I may go, hey, you know, we need to get back over here. We need to do this. But that's where the leadership kicks in. And I, like I said, I, I was blessed to have those 24 years of leadership under my belt. But find people around you. If you want to be a producer, find people around you that will get you on some shows, get you on some sets. And, and listen, learn, and when you get to that producer job, make sure you have people that are smarter than you around you and you can make it work. I, I Honestly, I am the least knowledgeable person on our team. <laughs> <laughs> I am because nobody can tell Thomas Dawson more about music than, than Thomas Dawson. The man's been a Commodore for 35 years. Wow. You know, nobody can tell Robert Bigelow on our team more about putting a movie together because he's been doing this for 20 some years. He's worked on Oscar nominated films. Yes. So, so, you know, you just sit back and go, right, Robert, what do we do next? <laughs> <laughs> and you let him do it. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and you don't get an ego because he's doing it. Like, well, why are people talking to Robert? Like we're, we're in a production right now. We're getting ready to head off to Arkansas here and about, of three, four weeks, we're going to be shooting a movie down there for about two months. And I told the production, the, the company that hired us, I said, all right, now, once we get to this point. So I spent like the first five or six weeks working with them to get the script right. That's where my strengths lie. And once we got the script ready, I said, now, going forward, you're going to probably be talking to Robert more than you're going to be talking to me. Because he's all things production, getting it all set up. Well... I could see where some people would have a problem with that because it would be like, well, why are they calling him? And I'm the, I'm the head of this company. No, yeah. no. You know, it's, it's time for him to be in his lane. Now, the relationship that we have with Robert is because he's part of the team is every day he's calling me. Hey, Ty, this was going on. Or, hey, do, can we do this? That's how it should work. Yes. You know, as a producer, that's how it should work. You hire people that you know and trust and you let them do their work. Amen. Don't Amen. micromanage. Don't micromanage. Great, great commentary, Ty. Thank you. That was a very, very detailed response for young people to hear because I think listening is the biggest thing. Listen, listen to the old heads. Listen to the old head with the old, you know, uh, you know, That's uh, right. Brim, the cap, and, and the gold chain, man. We know what we hey, talk about. Hey, right? Look, right? We're not ball for nothing, right? We're not ball for nothing. <laughs> I'm telling you, dude. I mean, we're, right. we're not ball for nothing, Ty. That's right. That's listen, right. Listen to, <laughs> <laughs> listen to the old That's heads, right. Man. That's right. Amen. <laughs> uh, so, Ty, uh, before we get out of here, this has been yeah. a great conversation, man. I tell you, I, I have loved this. We have destroyed this hour. What are some upcoming projects before we get out of here, Ty, that we can expect to see from you and Man's Mackey Studios coming up on the horizon? Yeah. So real quick, we have this one from uh, it's called Running the Bases. Uh, there's a great group of guys from a company called Up To You uh, Films. Um, and they it's three of them. And they wrote this beautiful script about a high school baseball coach and his team and, and his faith. Uh, they've, they've hired Man Smacky Studios to be their production company to make the movie. So we're, we, we will head out, I think it's the 28th of April, somewhere in that time frame when we head out to Arkansas to get started on that movie. Um, we have another movie for a gentleman out of Chicago um, called $1,200 in a Prayer that I'm working on the script right now to get it ready. And we're anticipating making that movie sometime uh, in the last quarter of this year. Okay. We'll be doing that. 
And I've just signed a, I, I just came on board to write a script for a former, very well known NFL football player that unfortunately I can't say the name until we get everything contracted. But uh, uh, I had my last interview with them the other night and they said, yep, you're our guy. When can we start this? So uh, we expect, I hope to have that script done this year and then we'll shoot that movie for them probably sometime early, first quarter of next year. And somewhere inside of that, we're going to try to do another Mads Mackey story that, you know, our movie, one of our movies. But right now we're kind of booked for three different movies from other people that we're going to be doing as a production company. So I hope to do our next movie called Believers, which is the next one on our slate. Okay. Um, and uh, it keeps the story going from My Brother's Keeper. Yes. So I wrote five movies in this series that starts with My Brother's Keeper and ends with another one, kind of like the Marvel Cinematic Universe. We're calling it the Faith Cinematic Universe. There you go. So Amen. so we plan on getting that one done sometime in the next 12, 15 months. Wow. Awesome stuff, Ty. I love it, man. I love it. Thank How can you. fans follow you on social media or by website? On social media, it's just Ty Mans, T-Y, Mans with an S. is M-A-N-N-S. Uh, so you can find me across the board there. And uh, Movie Maker Five Zero on Twitter, though. but then for the movie, go to MBK Film, like My Brother's Keeper, MBKFilm.com, and they can find out. They can see the trailer. They can buy tickets. Find out where the movie's playing. Churches can book the movie and show it. That's where they can go get all the information for My Brother's Keeper. MBKFilm.com. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been talking with screenwriter Ty Mans who just had over the weekend released My Brother's Keeper, starring T.C. Stallings. It was released in selected theaters over the weekend. If you get an opportunity to check it out, please do. And if you like this video, like and share and subscribe to the Maurice Brown Comedy Hour on YouTube tonight. Probably this afternoon, you can see the replay of this show with Ty Mans on Roku TV on the creative motion network so check it out if you uh get an opportunity great guy great man and he's doing some great things for the lord ty man's on the maurice brown show ty i want you to hang out don't go anywhere we're going to wrap things up but okay. i'd like to talk with you a little bit after the show ladies and gentlemen once again ty man's on the maurice brown show ty may the peace of christ be with you and your family brother god bless you and to you my friend thank you so much <laughs>